This session is going to deal with frequency synthesis and clock generation. For today's agenda, we have several topics. So what is a clock and what are common clock frequencies? Well, a clock signal is a square wave. The frequency is usually constant. Generally, one edge of the clock will be used in a D2A or an A to D converter to actually be the instant to either sample an analog signal or the instant to output an analog signal from a D2A converter. The frequencies uh, that are used for clocks uh, vary from the very low to the extremely high. And we've listed some examples here. I'm not going to go through each one of them. But as you can see, it ranges from the very low frequencies, one pulse per second in GPS, right up to very high frequencies, for example, 125 megahertz in Ethernet systems. So what kind of clock sources are available to engineers? The very simple uh, oscillators that could be used as clocks would include crystal oscillators and voltage control oscillators, or VCOs. These would be what we would call free running. You apply the power and you get a clock output. In the case of a crystal, the frequency of the clock is determined by the cut of the crystal. So it's a mechanical uh, implementation. In the case of a VCO, the frequency will be determined by a tank circuit made up of an L and C. And if the C is a varactor, that is a variable capacitor, then we have what's known as a tuning voltage, which will determine the output frequency. But I guess the thing to remember about these oscillators is that they are free running. Uh, there is no inherent feedback there, and uh, they may be susceptible to uh, various forms of drift, depending on, it, on time or on temperature, etc., or on supply. When we look at the area of high quality clocks, generally speaking, we have to talk about these clocks being generated either by phase lock loops or PLLs or by direct digital synthesis, which is DDS. If we look at phase lock loops, there are various types of phase lock loops. There are analog PLLs, which use an analog multiplier as a phase detector, but they are no longer in wide use. When the analog multiplier is replaced by a digital element called a phase frequency detector, or PFD, then we have a digital PLL. It's a simple architecture. It's got very high performance and low noise, and we will be talking in more detail about the digital PLL in the coming slides. If you take all the elements of a phase lock loop and replace them or implement them, using digital blocks, then you have what we call an all digital PLL. So the all digital PLL would use a digital PFD, a digital loop filter, and it would use a, a numerically controlled oscillator instead of a VCO. The all digital PLL does have some increased flexibility for faster locking over and above a regular digital PLL. It has a very good cleaning in terms of jitter, and it's very flexible. Then again, the, the jitter cleaning of a digital PLL is also very good. Next, we come to an alternative method for generating clocks, and that's direct digital synthesis. And direct digital synthesis is very popular in military and instrumentation applications. You can generate very high sine waves, very high quality um, sine waves and square waves. It works in the principle of uh, a lookup table in the digital domain and um, an accumulator um, hopping through the uh, lookup table, picking off points on a sine wave. Then uh, that particular uh, value of the sine wave is uh, converted into the analog domain by a high speed a to, a D2A converter. This enables a very high quality sine wave to be generated. And um, you can get very fast frequency sweeping and frequency hopping with this method. And to convert it into a regular uh, clock source, generally people will simply put a comparator after 
the uh, the sine wave generation to square it up. So if we have a look at the basic phase lock loop or PLL model, we have it here in diagram A. For comparison, I've shown in diagram B a standard negative feedback control system model. And the standard negative feedback control system model works on the principle of an error detector, an error signal output from the error detector with some forward gain going to an output. Then we take a portion of the output and feed it back to the negative input of the error detector. This is what's called closing the loop. So this is very much the standard architecture of um, an operational amplifier, for example, where you have an input voltage and an output voltage, and you can uh, very easily determine the transfer function of this particular function. The reason I've shown this here is to illustrate how similar it is to the basic diagram or the basic model for a PLL. Notice again, we have a lot of the same elements. The only difference is we're operating in the frequency domain rather than in the voltage domain. So we've got an input frequency. We've got a phase detector, which acts as an error detector. The forward gain element has a loop filter and a VCO. Then we take the output frequency, divide that down and input it back into the negative input of the phase detector. So we've closed the loop on our phase lock loop. And we can very easily determine that when the output from the error detector ES approaches zero, then you can say that the reference frequency and the feedback portion of the output frequency are equal. And if you say that, then you can also say that the F out equals N times F ref. And that establishes the basic equation for a phase lock loop. Just to show a typical block diagram for a digital PLL, I've shown here the ADF4350, which is very much an industry standard uh, PLL, I think at this stage is fair to say. And let's have a look at the various elements which are employed here. So we've got our reference input pin. In this particular case, uh, on the input um, signal, we have a 10-bit reference counter, we have a doubler, and we have another divide by two counter. So you've got various elements to provide flexibility here in terms of what input reference frequency you can use. When you come out of the reference divider, we go into our phase comparator, which makes up our PFD. This is followed by a charge pump to the charge pump output. The charge pump output then externally will feed a loop filter. And the output of the loop filter is fed back into our V-tune pin here, which drives our VCO core. So this is a fully integrated PLL VCO. We've got the, P we've got the synthesizer, we've got the VCO all in the one chip. And if you look at the VCO core here, it goes into a multiplexer. And one of the outputs from the multiplexer actually feeds back the VCO frequency to our N counter or N divider. And in this particular case, the N counter is um, what we call a fractional counter. It's got an integer term and a fractional term. And the output of that counter is then fed back to our phase comparator to close the loop. The fractionality of the, um, this portion here is actually implemented using a third order fractional interpolator. And we will be looking at this in a little bit more detail later. Suffice to say that a fractional N has the ability to uh, multiply the input reference frequency by a, a fractional uh, term. It's not simply an integer number all the time. And this does lead to greater flexibility in terms of frequencies which you can generate. Let's have a closer look at the phase frequency detector which drives the charge pump. In the analog devices PLLs, our PFDs are generally CMOS in nature and they're made up of a dual D-type flip-flop. So we have a diagram here for typical PFD or phase frequency detector driving the charge pump. 
So you can see we've got a positive input and we've got a negative input. And the D-type flip-flops are clocked on the positive edge of these inputs. The D inputs in each one are held high. And the outputs drive uh, a cord and sink and a cord and source. So an output at Q1, for example, would cause uh, a cord and source to be turned on and current to be injected into the loop filter in this direction here. Whereas a one at this point here will cause a cord and sink to be turned on and there will be current pulled from the loop filter. The other thing to look at here is the fact that there is feedback from the up and the down pins at the output of the two D-type flip-flops. They get uh, routed to an AND gate. We have a delay element and after the delay element, they go to the clear pins of the D-type flip-flop. So let's consider what happens in various conditions of a PLL. The first condition we look at is if the loop is not locked. It's out of frequency lock and out of phase lock, which means there will be no real relationship between the output frequency and the reference frequency. Now, the plus in input comes from the reference frequency and the minus in input is a divided down version of the VCO frequency. And in this particular case, we can see that the divided down version of the VCO is at a much lower frequency than the reference frequency. So what happens is as follows. On the first rising edge of plus in, the output here will go high, which will turn on this current source. It will stay high until we get a positive edge on the minus in. And that takes quite a while. Once we get a positive edge on the minus input, you can see the output goes low and this current sink is actually turned on. But because the plus in is at a much higher frequency than the minus in, you get a positive edge here again quite quickly, which turns the um, positive current source on again and the out goes high. So what you're seeing here is the fact that over a period of time, current is injected into the loop filter much more so than it's taken out of it. And this has the effect actually of increasing the voltage out of the charge pump or out of the loop filter, which drives the VCO. And increasing that voltage will increase the frequency at the output of the VCO. So we are driving the VCO in the direction we want to go. And eventually we will get to a situation where the plus in still is the same frequency as before coming from the ref in. But now the minus in coming back from the VCO is going to approach the frequency of the plus in. And when this happens, you get a different waveform coming uh, at the out pin. And in fact, now what you see is a series of current pulses which represent the phase difference between the plus in and the minus in. And this really represents the last step in locking the loop. This series of current pulses is simply um, bringing the um, output of the VCO into phase lock with the reference input. And eventually you will get them both frequency and phase locked. And when you have them both frequency and phase locked, what you actually see at the out pin is a very small positive going and negative going pulse, which pretty much cancel each other out. They are important, however, that they are there and that you get some pulse of current injected into the loop. The reason for this is if you didn't have anything here, then the loop would simply drift and not effectively be in lock anymore. Uh, and it's called entering a dead zone. And in older PLLs, they suffer from this problem of the dead zone, where they could get into a situation where uh, you were locked, but then 
you would not get any effective output from the charge pump and the output would drift away. And that's not a good thing. We get around that by uh, this feedback element and this delay element. We call this delay element the anti-backlash pulse width. You can program this to be a certain width and that delay there actually determines the width of these little pulses here in diagram C. And really, uh, the PFD and charge pump are very much at the heart of the phase lock loop. And they determine, for example, uh, the quality in terms of phase noise that you can get from the PLL. Any noise in here will exhibit itself uh, in the overall noise of the PLL. I talked already about the various elements of the PLL and the critical element being the phase detector. I mentioned briefly on the 4350 that we can add a reference divider to go between the F ref and the input to the PFD. Adding the reference divider gives us more flexibility in our PLL. It allows us to use a wider range of reference frequencies because the frequency into the phase detector will be limited. Depending on the technology, it can be limited to 20 megahertz, it can be limited to um, 32 megahertz. Newer PLLs have higher PFD frequencies, but even these need to be conditioned. That's why having a reference divider here is so important. And of course, having a reference divider will change the transfer function of the PLL because now you can say that F out equals F ref multiplied by N but divided by R. So it comes in here, gets divided by R, and F1 then is the frequency that get multi gets multiplied by N to give you F out. Another very common element that we add to PLLs is a prescaler. And the prescaler, we call it an RF prescaler, at the output of the VCO, instead of going directly into an end counter like is shown here in diagram A, more commonly what we do, as in diagram B, is we go from the output of the VCO into a prescaler and then into the end counter. And the reason for this is quite simple. The end counter generally is fabricated in CMOS, and the frequency of that CMOS operation can be somewhere between 200 to 4 or 500 megahertz. However, generally, the frequencies we want to synthesize with our PLL can be anything up to 6, 8 gigahertz. Common frequencies in wireless base stations are 2 gigahertz, for example. So in order to be able to synthesize those, we need a bipolar counter at the front end, giving a fixed divide to condition the high frequency down to a frequency that the end counter can then act upon. And this again affects the overall transfer function. And now what we can say is that the transfer function is F out equals F ref multiplied by N P divided by R. This diagram here shows us an all digital PLL. It's the AD9557. I talked already about the various elements of a PLL. In this case, we've got our digital phase frequency detector. Now we have a digital loop filter and we've got a 32-bit numerically controlled oscillator. And you can see the output of the 30-bit numerically controlled oscillator is fed back into our end counter, uh, a fractional element here, and then back into the digital PFD. So this is an all-digital PLL core. The same chip actually also has a, a regular digital PLL with a phase frequency detector, an analog loop filter, a VCO, regular VCO, fed back in this manner here to um, an end counter and back to close the loop. So this device actually has two PLLs in the one chip. It's got an all digital PLL core and it's got a regular digital PLL as well. I want to compare integer end PLLs with fractional end PLLs. 
And this diagram here tries to show the difference between the two. In diagram A, we've got an integer n arrangement. And I'm taking an example where we want to synthesize a 900 megahertz frequency. And I'm doing it for a GSM system. And in GSM, channel spacings are 200 kilohertz. So if you were tuning in a GSM system, you'd want to tune in 200 kilohertz steps. So you'd go from 900 megahertz to 900.2, 900.4, etc. If you want to do this with an integer n, this is a typical arrangement for doing it. In this particular case, we have a 10 megahertz reference input signal. We use an R divider to divide it down by 50 to give us 200 kilohertz at the PFD input. And then we use an N counter and program the N counter to 4501. And if you do the maths in that, you see that you come out with an output frequency of 900.2 megahertz. I guess the critical thing to note in an integer and PLL is that the output channel spacing is determined by the PFD frequency. Whatever the PFD frequency is, that's the limit to your output channel spacing or limit to your output resolution. Again, it's because you're using integer elements in the feedback. If you now consider the same scenario, but decide to use a fractional end device to synthesize the same system, this is what you might have. Again, we've got a 10 megahertz reference. This time we divide by 10 to give us one megahertz. And if we have one megahertz at the PFD, to synthesize 900.2 megahertz, we use an integer part and a fractional part. And it's pretty obvious that the integer part in this case would be 900, and the fractional part would be one over five. So if you take your one megahertz and multiply it by 900 plus one fifth, you're gonna end up with 900.2 megahertz. Then if you want to move to the next channel, 900.4 megahertz, you would simply change the fractional from one over five to two over five. And you increment channels in that fashion. The overall effect of this is as follows. It means that the N counter is 900.2. You can see that the N counter in the integer N was four and a half thousand. And the output phase noise in a PLL is proportional to the value in the N counter. The noise gets multiplied up by the value N and it's a 20 log N relationship. Therefore, if you were able to reduce significantly the N counter value, you will reduce significantly the noise, the phase noise in the output signal. In addition to that, because your PFD is operating at a higher frequency in a fractional N, you're going to be able to lock the PLL a lot faster than the integer N type. So there are the two major advantages of fractional N. The disadvantage of fractional N, of course, is how you implement the fractionality, generally by a sigma delta converter. There's going to be a lot of clocking action going on, and it produces a lot of spurious elements in the output. So the output won't be as clean in terms of spurs for a fractional N, but the actual noise floor for the phase noise will be much lower. So what are some key PLL specifications? Obviously the RF input frequency, there's a minimum and a maximum for that. Phase noise and phase jitter are critical specifications. When a PLL is used as a local oscillator in a, an up converter or a down converter, then phase noise is the spec that will most concern the design engineer. However, if the signal is being used to clock an A to D or a D to A converter, then it's going to be phase jitter will be important. And the phase jitter will determine the sampling instant in an A to D converter, for example and the jitter and uncertainty on that sampling instant. So that's important. Reference spurs 
Certainly when it's uh, producing a, a local oscillator, then reference bars are important specifications. You've got frequency lock time and you've got phase lock time. Both of these are related and both are important. In particular, they're important, I guess, in local oscillators where it's changing and you're tuning uh, to different frequencies. It's not so much important in um, clocking applications because generally in clocking applications, it is what we call a fixed frequency application. It's set up to deliver a constant clock frequency. Output frequency error, of course, is important and output phase error. And we have to be very aware of the loop bandwidth and the phase margin when we design our phase lock loop. Again, we have tools which help design engineers to choose the best balance between loop bandwidth and frequency lock time and phase lock time, for example. And obviously you want a stable design and you have to ensure that the phase margin is sufficient to ensure stability. So these are all specifications which are important in PLLs. Some of the common uses for PLLs, uh, frequency translation, that's going from one frequency, frequency to another, jitter cleanup, you might have a noisy clock, you can apply that to a PLL and use the band limiting of the loop filter to actually take a lot of noise out. Then in clock systems, you can have redundant clocking systems. You might want to have some holdover in a clocking system. And a clock distribution is a very big part of the uses for PLLs. Let's take an example of a frequency translation system. In this particular case, we are taking a sonnet clock running at 19.44 MHz, and we're translating that to 156.25 MHz. So here's under ref A, we've got 19.44. It's being applied to our reference dividers. We've got a multiplexer here, it's being applied into the uh, PFD. Then we've got an on-chip VCO. That gets divided down, we close the loop. In this particular case, the settings are shown here which will allow us to go from 19.44 to 156.25. The phase detector frequency is running at 120 kilohertz and the VCO frequency is 1.875 gigahertz. Very straightforward example. Jitter cleanup is a very important part of um, the uses of PLLs. You can have a clean signal coming from a main clock board and that clean signal then can go onto a backplane with lots of noise sources. So the clock that actually comes uh, along the backplane and is delivered to a line card can be contaminated. Basically, we can use analog devices, PLLs, and clock and timing circuits to clean up these signals. Holdover is the ability to maintain an output signal even when the reference input disappears. And holdover can be initiated either by a processor in the system or there can be a monitoring function there which will automatically switch into holdover mode if the reference input goes away. Then we have another um, feature called switchover. And switchover provides additional security beyond the holdover function. In switchover, actually, uh, you can have a main reference clock and a secondary clock. And it's very important that um, if the main clock disappears and you switch to the secondary clock, that you don't get any runt pulses or extra long pulses uh, from the change. So the analog devices solutions have to maintain uh, a constant steady clock whether it's coming from the main clock or from the secondary clock. So switch over, synchronization and hold over. What happens when the reference disappears? The PLL maintains the output clock in hold over. In using PLL and DDS chips, it's very important to have 
good tools to help design engineers. And Analog Devices has a number of these tools available free online for download. And I've listed them here. We've got a tool called ADI SimClock, which is a design tool um, which helps in the system design of clocks using ADI components. We also have ADI SimPLL, which helps in the design and simulation of phase lock loops using standard components from ADI. We have ADI Sim DDS, and this again helps the user to select and to evaluate the analog devices, direct digital synthesis chips. As well as all these, we have an online support community called Engineer Zone, and the link for that is provided here. There's a full range of evaluation boards for DDS, clock generation and distribution, and PLLs. And for all of these, there's a full suite of Windows compatible software. If you look at this link here, it will give you a list of the evaluation kits available from ADI. So ADI SIM clock, this is the front screenshot for that. And here's the link for ADI SIM clock. Likewise, ADI SIM PLL, we're now at version 3.5. And here's the link for it. ADI SIM DDS. Some screenshots here also, and here's the link for ADI SIM DDS. Our Engineer Zone support community has various sections dedicated to different topics. For example, we have a link for DDS topics, we have a link for clock and timing topics. And we have a link for the PLL topics and other general RF topics. So I've provided all the links here if you want to go and check out any of these. So let's have a look at some clocking applications for phase lock loops. This clocking application shown here is for a wireless transceiver card. And the wireless transceiver card can have various different functions on it. It can have several channels of A to D conversion. It can have a digital down converter or an ASIC or a digital up converter or an FPGA. It can have D to A converters. All of these will need clocks. And those clocks can be provided by the clock distribution and generation chips from ADI. So let's, let's look now at a clocking application for a line card. For example, you could have an optical transceiver here. On this main card here, the line card, you will have some clock generation and distribution. You will have power sequencing. And then we have a switch card with a digital cross point switch. So here in the line card, you can see the clock generation and distribution function. New ADI clock products such as the AD9557 and the 9548 are specifically geared for network applications. And here's an example of where the 9548 might be used. We've got a line card and we've got a timing card. Here on the line card, we've got clock recovery and we've got an IEEE 1588 timestamp. On the timing card here, we use the AD9548 to actually generate the one pulse per second coming from GPS. Here you can see we've got a reference source, which can be a TCXO or an OCXO. We then have the PLL function generating this one pulse per second which is delivered to the line car. We've talked quite a bit about phase lock loops for clock generation. Now I want to talk a little bit about DDS, or direct digital synthesis.
As I briefly mentioned already, DDS works on the principle of a lookup table in the digital domain. And in that lookup table, you can um, have it driven from what we call an accumulator. And the accumulator will pick various points from the sine wave that's in the lookup table. It will take them and it will apply them to a D2A converter, which converts them into the analog domain. Obviously, over time, if you look at these points, they will make up a sine wave. And this is our DDS. This is our DAC output. Because they're distinct points in time, you get this type of output waveform from the D2A converter. We use what's known as a reconstruction filter, which smooths out the sine wave like that. So this is a high quality sine wave now. And if we take that and we apply a limiter or a comparator after that, we simply square up the signal to give us our desired clock. That's what it would look like in the time domain. In a frequency domain response, this is what ideally you would expect to see. Here, because it's not a pure sine wave, you'll get a sync function uh, construction. Ideally, if you filter the sync function, you will filter out the odd order harmonics, which are shown here, and you'll be left with a fundamental frequency. And again, if you then square that up, you will be left with a fundamental frequency and all the odd order harmonics. So that's the ideal frequency domain response. If we look at a real world frequency response, of course, it's somewhat different. To start with, the signal coming from the DDS won't be simply this one frequency element here and some harmonics. There will be spurious elements also, which are shown here. And of course, when we apply filtering, we will not filter completely the higher order signals here and we won't filter the spurious elements so this is what we'll be left with and then if you square up that you actually get multiples of the spores as well as the um, fundamental frequency in the spectrum so you can see the spectrum you end up with is not an ideal spectrum of course we try and minimize all these other spurious elements we can look at a DDS, um, the internal workings of a DDS in terms of a phase wheel. And if we look at the DDS, as I said already, we will use a phase accumulator. Here we have a phase register, which I refer to as a lookup table. It's essentially the same thing. And of course, we've got um, our input serial words here. We have the program a phase register. So here you see the phase wheel as it moves around picking off points on the circle and it's actually constructing a sine wave, approximation to a sine wave here. So we're building up the sine wave. And we're building it up from the phase register. It's phase to amplitude converter. This is our phase to amplitude converter giving us the sine wave. This will then be applied to the DAC, bringing it into the analog domain. And we have a, an external reconstruction filter. So this is showing us the signal flow through the DDS architecture. Here's the phase wheel. The bigger the jump here each time actually results in a higher output frequency eventually. If you take very small steps, you will end up with a lower, more precise output signal. So we've got a phase accumulator. We've got the phase to amplitude converter into the D2A converter and then out to the output filter. 
And here's a block diagram of our latest DDS chip. It's the AD9858. And you can see here the elements we talked about already. We've got a frequency accumulator. We've got a phase accumulator. We've got phase to amplitude conversion and into the D2A converter. This is capable of running at a clock frequency of one giga sample per second. And in practical terms, generating an output frequency somewhere between two and 300 megahertz. Now, since a lot of systems will need frequencies much higher than that, the AD9858 has an additional PLL on there. So this PLL actually allows you to go from the two or 300 megahertz generated here up to the gigahertz regions, up to two or three gigahertz. So you would take the output of the DAC, go into a reconstruction filter. You would then take that signal and use it as the reference for um, the, the, uh, the PLL. So you've got a PLL here. You've got a charge pump to an external VCO and you close the loop then in this fashion here. Back through this signal path. And so the one chip does provide you with, with quite a lot of the elements you will need to go from a DDS all the way up to very high frequencies. And here's an example of a DDS single loop up conversion using the 9858. As I said already, you'll program the um, the DDS. Here's the DAC. We go to our external low pass filter. In this case, then we're using a divider element and we're dividing the output here, which can be anywhere from DC to 400 megahertz. And this is what provides the F ref, as I mentioned already, to our PLL section. And now we can take that and we can multiply it up by this factor K and um, achieve a much higher frequency. So we've got an external loop filter, an external VCO, and in this case, we have an external K value um, to give us a higher frequency than the 400 megahertz. So we've talked about DDS, we've talked about PLLs. There's advantages and disadvantages to each of them. For example, if you take the list we have here, and go through different requirements in a system. The DDS will be advantageous in some and the PLL in others. So for example, for frequency resolution and agility and for phase res resolution and agility and amplitude resolution and agility, the DDS generally comes out on top. However, for power consumption, for output frequency range, price, spectral purity, ancillary circuitry and up conversion, the PLL will come out on top. I guess it's fair to say that the differences between the two are getting less. And on the one hand, um, the PLLs are developing new features to allow faster locking, for example, and more resolution, whereas DDS chips, as they... Um, shrink in geometries can also go higher in frequency and approach some of the uh, performance of the PLLs. You can also get hybrid configurations where you combine DDS and PLLs. For example, we showed one where you use the PLL to up convert from the output of the DDS. There's other ones then as well where you can have a PLL just providing the reference to a DDS. And we've shown a couple of other uh, configurations here as well. Finally, I'd like to talk about that clocking D2A and A to D converters. And what we can say is you need absolute accuracy in the clock for reproduction of an analog signal in a D2A. And if you have any jitter on your clock, that will lead to distortion. Effective aperture delay time measured with respect to an ADC input, an A to D input. So, for example, you have a sampling clock, but there's a delay. 
between the edge of the sampling clock and when the actual sample is taken on the input sine wave. And what's important is not the absolute value of that delay, but what's really important is the variation from cycle to cycle. And that variation from cycle to cycle is essentially the jitter in the clock. So clock jitter is the sample to sample variation in the encode clock. And there's a well-known formula which equates the signal to noise ratio for in the system um, relating to the jitter of the clock. This is dealt with in much more detail in AN501 and AN756. I would advise that you look up both of those application notes. They're a very good source of information on this particular topic. This diagram here shows us how jitter affects performance in an ATD converter. We've got an analog input frequency here on the x-axis and we've got a signal to noise ratio on the y-axis. We've got a, a series of plots and the series of plots here relate to jitter on clocks, various levels of jitter on the encode clock. So for very high jitter, what we're showing here is that for a particular input frequency, your signal to noise ratio is going to be limited in this case to 60 dBs with an analog input of 200 megahertz with an 800 femtosecond jitter on the clock you'll never get better than 60 dBs if however you only had 100 femtoseconds jitter on the same clock you would be capable of achieving 78 dBs much higher performance now, if you're using a 12 or 14 bit converter and you're um, applying a 200 megahertz input signal to it, then you're going to need a clock in this region. There's no point in using a clock uh, of 800 femtoseconds, which is going to limit, no matter how good the converter is, is going to limit the SNR to 60 dBs. So the message really is that as the resolution of your system and as the analog input bandwidth of your signal increase, you're going to need a better and better clock in terms of jitter. And we've taken an example here of a real world experiment we did in the lab. We looked at the AD9434, which is a 12-bit 500 mega sample converter. It's got an SNR of 65 dBs with a 250 megahertz input signal sampling at 500 megahertz. That's the critical spec. And let's have a look at what we found in the lab. If we use an SMA100A, which is a high quality benchtop signal generator as the clock for this A to D converter, indeed we're able to achieve 64.9 dBs SNR. Uh, we're applying a 200 megahertz signal in this case. And you can see the spectrum here is, is clean. It's good. We experimented then with various setups on our uh, AD, ADF4351. Eventually, we came up with a, a setting with plus 2 dBm on the output of the 4351. And we achieved a, a, an SNR of 64.856. So it's very close to the um, performance of the SMA100A. So that's, you know, a component that costs less than $5, giving you the same performance as a benchtop instrument costing several thousand dollars. It is worth noting, however, if you look at the spectrum, that uh, the spectrum with this SMA100A is still cleaner down in the noise floor. There are more spurious elements with the 4351. Now we will be looking at this more closely to see if we can improve upon it further. But already you can see we are getting very good performance from this. And if you look at the jitter, which is contributed by various types of logic uh, from the very old 74LS at 4.9 picoseconds all the way to the latest uh, 
in uh, clock chips from ADI 0.1 picoseconds, they all have additive jitter. So obviously the higher the performance of the system, the lower jitter you want from any components that are in the uh, signal chain. This diagram then shows the performance of various chips from ADI and what the actual wideband RMS jitter is for various uh, devices that are available. I mentioned the 4351 for example, that's one of them shown here. Uh, it's got uh, a jitter uh, capability somewhere between uh, 200 and 250 femtoseconds. Voltage controlled oscillators, just to finish with these, are um, simple elements. They are adjustable by means of an RC circuit and you can get very high frequencies from them. We have a new family of VCOs, the ADF 5508, and they can uh, generate an output from 7 to 8 gigahertz. Then we have some examples of clock distribution. So we have chips like the AD9513 and the AD9511. And these are um, available in various uh, output levels. You can use um, LVPECL, LVDS, uh, CMOS levels with any of these. So they're very versatile chips in clock distribution systems. The AD9516 is a 1 to 3 gigahertz um, PLL with um, a lot of output drivers. You've got PECL drive, LV PECL, LVDS or CMOS as well. And this is showing the AD9512, which is a 1.2 gigahertz clock distribution system. Here's the performance attainable with that. ADI's complete clock portfolio. You've got digital and all digital PLLs. We've got synthesizers. We've got clock distribution chips and we've got voltage controlled oscillators. Today we covered uh, an overview of frequency synthesis in clocking. We talked a bit about phase locked loops. We talked about di di direct digital synthesis. The software tools help and greatly simplify the setup of co complex frequency synthesis devices. Again, the message the central message from today is that the clocks for data converters need to have low jitter to keep distortion at a minimum and to deliver the performance that is specified for the data converters. Specialized clock generation and distribution will allow precise frequency tuning and phase control.